one of the characteristics for us as a particular form of knowledge that design-based research produces, and we call that local or domain-specific instructional theories. And we don't just mean the domain of mathematics, which is my area. We mean particular domains within mathematics. So I worked for a number of years focused on statistics at the middle school level. And what does a domain-specific instructional theory look like in statistics? Well, basically, it specifies a learning trajectory, not necessarily for individual students, but it can be for the classroom community, which is pretty detailed. It's a series of uh, a demonstration of a substantiated learning route, together with the very specific means of supporting and organizing that learning. And that's always the instructional tasks, it's computer tools or other resources, but also forms of classroom discourse, for example, nature of classroom norms, the organisation of classroom activities, and the norms of participation in each type of activity. So we take a relatively broad view of instructional design. That would be, for us, a primary type of theory that you can produce with design-based research. Now, I think there's a lot of other theories that can be produced. One of the issues for me, for example, if we're working at the classroom level, is how you go about analysing or making sense of that complexity of the classroom. And you do that, you need theoretical constructs to help you see pattern or regularity in what appears to be really messy and complex. And for us, design-based research is very much a context into which to develop those types of theories or ideas as well. So those would be for us the more positively primary characters. There's a whole bunch of other theories. For example, a colleague of mine Kay McLean comes very much from a teaching background. So in the context of our design experiments, she, she's often been the teacher. And she's focused on analysing her own learning as a teacher in the context of doing the design experiment. She's so focused particularly on her learning in the context of orchestrating whole class discussions. More recently, another sort of thing that's become of interest, we think typically just in terms of kids knowledgeability, whether it's in math or science or whatever, but the process of cultivating kids' interests, development of kids' identities as doers of math. How do you bring that about? That would seem to me to be the sort of problem or issue that, for which design experiments are really good. I view it as constructing or developing theoretical or conceptual tools to do useful work in supporting people's learning. We've talked right now very specifically about supporting students' learning. I think the way of working, the way of developing theory generalizes. So for example, more recently we focused on supporting teachers' learning. We've worked with two groups of teachers for a number of years who work in urban districts, middle school level. And we've done a design experiment very consciously uh, to investigate conjectures about supporting teachers' learning. I and a colleague were just about to support a project where we're trying to do a design experiment at the level of school districts, uh, bringing about change at that level. So it leads to new levels of complexity, the need for new theoretical tools, but the basic orientation and the key tenets of design research hold up or generalize across those, but the content changes. You know, because for example, if you're working in the classroom, you typically are focusing on developing kids' learning in one setting. If you're working with teachers, you're consciously having to support learning across two settings, professional development and their classroom situated in the institutional setting of the school. So it gives rise to the challenge of how do you conceptualise learning across settings? So new issues come up. And for us, it's the approach of building the plane by flying it. Uh, doing the experiment, and in the, if you're aware of these issues, is the context to work out some of these theoretical challenges. Rather, I view design research, you asked about which type of theories, I view it as a really a bootstrapping method. I think it's really powerful or really useful if you're interested in the sort of issues I've talked about in the theoretical base or research basis thin right now. Whether it's particular domains in mathematics or science and you're trying to support kids' learning, 
or particular issues in teacher development. It's a way to bootstrap your way up by your continually testing and revising as you go. Mm. The alternative is to wait till that research base gets laid in place before you can begin to mess with the instruction. Mm. It's an alternative. If you saw there was a special issue on design research in Journal of Learning Sciences that came out in 2004, and Eamon Kelly had an article in there, and it's really well worth reading. I tell you, my initial reaction was, gee, he teed off on design research. <laughs> I then went back and reread it because I used it in a class, and I saw it in a very different light. Interestingly, everybody in my class didn't like it and thought he'd really teed off. I now view it as it was a really noble effort to push us from a friendly critic. And he, I think he said some things that were really well worth listening to in that article. One, he's pushing for rigor. And obviously you have to say rigor that's appropriate to the problems, issues and forms of knowledge being developed. But he makes this point. He says if you take any mature methodology, you can lay out the logic of argumentation or the warrants for how you link final claims to data, to the process of generating and collecting data, independently of any particular study. Mm -hmm. So you can lay out the network or the chain of warrants for randomized field trials, for example. You can't do that for design-based design research right now. Right. That's a real weakness. That's a sign of a fledgling, still developing methodology. So I think we really have to uh, work very hard to A, specify, explicate, dig out the nature of the warrants we make. We make them in action as we conduct particular studies. We have to pull out one of those network of warrants and you know, reach some sort of agreement or consensus and start holding each other accountable, understanding that it's also a living thing that they can evolve and change. Another thing we make a big deal of, which we think is underdeveloped in design-based research, a lot of emphasis on the design side, people developing and improving designs. The other part is the research part, and the research part means you need frameworks, theoretical tools to look at the situations in which you're working, whether it's classrooms or people in everyday work settings or whatever it is. The frameworks of the constructs you use affect clearly your ongoing interpretations which have pragmatic impact on the nature of how your experiment goes. It affects those local testing and revising conjectures in your design decisions. It's also your framework in effect has assumptions about what's necessary and contingent in your design. So I think we have to start holding each other accountable to laying out what are our frameworks and have that as an expectation. And right now, if you read a lot of reports of design studies, you really have to work hard to dig out what were the assumptions mm -hmm. about learning, about the learning ecology, and the relationship between